Welcome to the Consortium of Universities for Global Health webinar, Interprofessional Global Health Competencies, Consensus and Controversies. I'm Dr. Jessica Ebert, and it's a pleasure to be moderating this webinar today. We have a wonderful lineup of experts and thought leaders in the area of global health competencies, and we hope that we're going to go through some of the basic concepts as well as some of the more in-depth analysis and critical thinking around global health competencies. Quickly, I just want to introduce my fellow panelists. We have Virginia Routhorn from University of Maryland, Center for Global Health Global Education Initiatives. We have Quentin Eichbaum from Vanderbilt University. We have Linda Wilson from University of Alabama, Birmingham. We have Lori Dupree Brown from University of Wisconsin Madison and Kevin Wynn from University of Wisconsin Madison. So I will uh, welcome all our presenters on your behalf and we are going to get started. First, we have uh, Virginia Routhorn speaking about some basic definitions of competencies. Welcome, Virginia. Thank you, uh, Jessica. So today we're talking about competencies, and I just wanted to give everyone a quick background. Competencies are used in the workplace and in educational institutions to express a standard level of performance that can be assessed to measure if the competency has been achieved. Competencies are often framed in terms of knowledge, skills, and attitudes, uh, or you may have heard the phrase KSAs. This taxonomy of learning behaviors is thought to represent the goals of the learning process. That is, after a learning episode, the learner should have acquired new skills, knowledge, or attitudes that meet a predefined learning objective. Competency statements are not wish lists or lists of content topics. They describe an acceptable level of performance and the skills needed to perform at that level. A listing of competencies is also not a curriculum, but it can facilitate the process of developing a curriculum. Next slide, please. So as you all know, interest in global health among students in high-income in high countries is skyrocketing. Approximately 250 North American universities now have global health education offerings. It's this rapid growth and often haphazard expansion that has led to a lack of agreed upon definitions and failure to standardize curricula and competencies. This is the reason that there has been a strong push among global health educators to develop global health competencies. So, in many professions, they have already developed global health competencies, including nursing, medicine, and dentistry. And I put here two citations to articles setting forth profession-specific global health competence, uh, competencies, including dental competencies and nursing global health competencies, um, spearheaded the nursing effort spearheaded by Dr. Linda Wilson, who will speak shortly. In medicine, there has been a lot of work to develop global health competencies for medical trainees. And I've put some of those efforts here, including the early work of Jeff Heck and Ron Puss in 1993 called A National Consensus on the Essential International Health Curriculum for Medical Schools, all the way through to the Global Health Learning Outcomes for UK Medical Students, developed by the UK Global Health Learning Outcomes Group in 2012. However, in their 2013 article, Global Health Education in U.S. Medical Schools, Omar Khan and his colleagues found that there was little uniformity in U.S. medical uh, global health curricula and recommended basic curriculum with progressively more advanced electives where applicable. At the same time that the individual professions were developing global health com competencies for their own professions, there was growing acknowledgement that global health requires a broad range of professionals from health and non-health disciplines. In other words, an interprofessional approach to global health. This is reflected in the most commonly accepted definition of global health from Copeland et al., which states that global health emphasizes transnational health issues, determinants, and solutions, and involves many disciplines within and beyond the health sciences and promotes interdisciplinary collaboration. However, universities have been slow to adopt interprofessional education, and institutions remain highly siloed 
including in the area of global health. As many of you know, innumerable universities support multiple global health programs in different schools on a single campus that don't necessarily talk to each other. The American Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health was the first to address this issue in 2011 when it published its global health competency model. As you can see, um, the first domain here, capacity strengthening. In other words, what this ASPPH model is proposing is that all global health students, no matter what profession, understand critical concepts in the area of capacity building, among other things. As you can see from the paragraph I added here at the bottom, the model was specifically designed for global health students in a broad range of programs, not just public health programs. To add to this ASPPH global health competency model, I worked with my colleague Jody Olson here at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and others to create an additional domain for interprofessional global health called the Team Skills Competency Framework to help students successfully employ their substantive knowledge as part of an effective global health team. We did this because the best planned global health initiative can fail if the team, including local collaborators, cannot work together effectively and respectfully. Our team skills domain borrows heavily from the field of interprofessional, interprofessional education, or IPE, an approach to teaching clinical teamwork to improve patient outcomes. For those of you who don't know, the WHO defines IPE as when students from two or more professions learn about, from, and with each other. The ultimate goal of IPE is collaborative practice, which the WHO defines as when multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds work together with patients, families, caregivers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care. The most prominent uh, work in the interprofessional education field is core competencies for interprofessional collaborative practice developed by the Interprofessional Education Collaborative in 2011. The report identified four interprofessional competency domains as essential for healthcare practitioners, values and ethics, roles and responsibilities, interprofessional communication, and teams and teamwork. Within each domain are listed 10 to 12 specific competencies. As an example, I've put here uh, four specific competencies in the values and ethics domain. As you can see, values and ethics one, for example, states that students should place the interests of patients and populations at the center of interprofessional health care delivery. Dr. Olson and I felt that the IPEC competencies were incredibly valuable, but not sufficiently tailored to global health. The IPEC competencies focus primarily on clinical care and clinical outcomes, which are not broad enough to encompass professions like law and social work that are often part of the global health team. So Dr. Olson and I convened a working group to adapt them to global health. On the right, you can see the final product of our project, the Team Skills Competency Domain for Global Health. Lori Dupreet Brown from the University of Wisconsin-Madison was part of that working group and will shortly talk about implementing competency-based education at her institution. But first, I'll pass the mic to Dr. Lind Linda Wilson, who will talk about her CUGH-sponsored effort to create interdisciplinary global health competencies. Linda? Yeah, thank you so much, Virginia and Jessica. It's a pleasure to be with you. Just briefly, um, in 2013, I was asked to lead a subcommittee of the CUGH Education Committee by then uh, CUGH Chair Tim Brewer. And our goal was to search the literature and identify whether there's a need for interprofessional global health competencies, and if so, to develop such competencies. We had a, a, a large group of about 12 uh, people who work to review an extensive and growing body of literature in disciplinary uh, competencies as well as interprofessional competencies that Virginia has mentioned. 
And we proposed that uh, ultimately there be four different levels of competencies and subsequently pu published a paper, which you can see here in the Annals of Global Health, and that is an open access paper. It was published in 2015. Uh, and we laid out proposed competencies for two of the four levels that we proposed. And you can see here some of the different organizations, uh, web pages that we reviewed in addition to many other peer reviewed articles that had been published to come up with these competencies. We drew heavily on the Association of Schools of Public Health competency framework and ultimately proposed these 11 domains of global health competencies. The next slide will briefly show you what some of the actual uh, competency levels were that we proposed. Global citizen level is a, a level that we think every university student should, should uh, attain, that not just those in the health professions. And then the exploratory level for those who are considering future professional pursuits in global health Maybe they're going on an initial global field experience. Uh, then the basic operational level, these are for students who are in uh, health-related disciplines and expect to address uh, and focus their initiatives on global health, and then level four, advanced. I want to just, uh, as an aside, uh, highlight the definition of global health by Copeland et al. that we used as our framework and that we differentiated global health from international health. So, so global can occur at the local level as well as outside of one's country. Uh, our, uh, our work focused then on the global citizen level and that level three, the basic uh, program-oriented level for those who are considering global health careers. And here's an example. We identified whether each of the competencies was a knowledge, skill, or attitude, which level it applied to, and then we cited the references that we drew on to support that particular competency. Uh, I ended my three-year term as chair of the Global Competency Subcommittee last year, and now Jessica Ebert is the chair. And I'm pleased to say that the subcommittee is working to develop a toolkit of resources that could be used to teach each of these proposed competencies. And that toolkit will soon be available on the CUGH website. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to follow in your footsteps. And one of the um, things that we all noted and that Clinton's going to go into more detail about uh, towards the end of the webinar is that Although there was a lengthy review process of both articles as well as professional organizations, um, as part of the CGH foundational competencies, one of the things that's missing from this dialogue often or is difficult to uh, emphasize is the voice of host communities and partners in the global south, in low and middle income countries or in um, underserved communities in our own backyard. So a group of researchers from nine countries convened as an offshoot of the CGH competency subcommittee and we created um, the research study on host perspectives of global health competencies. This study was led up by Child Family Health International and Bridge to Health Medical and Dental and um, attempted to gather more host community um, and grassroots perspectives on what learner develop, what ideal learner development is and whether our competencies that we developed as part of the Annals of Global Health article are really on point with regard to perspectives of people who are teaching our students often outside of our students' frame of reference. And um, excitingly, we had respondents from over 30 countries. The survey mechanism was in French, English, and Spanish. Um, we had representation of our colleagues and partners in the Global South and the Global North that are hosting students from outside their country from a variety of different educational levels. So undergraduate, you can see, was the most common. So 92% of people were hosting undergraduates. And then you can see um, medical students, nursing, public health students, business, law, PhD, et cetera. So a nice sampling of a variety of both students as well as partner perspectives. 
We looked um, at the competencies through the lens of like pre-departure, during the field work experience, and then post-experience. And one of the things that was interesting was that the perceptions around preparedness, so pre-departure training is something that we're all focusing on improving and making sure is consistent at our institutions. So zero respondents to the survey, um, and there was over 170 70 responses said that students are completely unprepared. 22% said they were well prepared, so there is some room for improvement. Um, and one of the most important competencies that partners reported, reported is students being aware of the influence of culture on health and healthcare. And the next most important competency was actually having humility. So that's really important because we created a dichotomy between humility and confidence. Um, particularly in highly professionalized settings, often confidence is something students feel like they need to have and is somewhat culturally valued. But um, humility was definitely um, a, a more desirable trait than, than confidence. Um, during electives and field experience, we looked at a variety of different competencies, both based on the CUGH competencies as well as other competency sets. Um, some of the things that came out as most important included students recognizing their personal limitations, students demonstrating interprofessional values and being respectful of all staff, students demonstrating professionalism and respecting the entire team as well as culture and cultural practices. Very important for culture for students to understand the um, the cultural perceptions of disease and cultural impacts to behavior. Um, and so really we, we, we really saw a very strong emphasis on students learning about cultural aspects, which is very important because oftentimes schools will, will want to emphasize technical skills building rather than some of the softer skills building such as communication and cultural understanding. And so this is some evidence that perhaps we need to rethink how we are incentivizing or giving credit to different international or local global health fieldwork experiences. With regard to clinical skill sets, and not all students were clinical, but of those that are, um, Things like performing surgical procedures and managing rare diseases were not as strongly as important. And certainly caring for patients without supervision, which unfortunately we see when students are placed in positions of uh, volunteering beyond their skill level, um, that was not found to be important. So that's, that's uh, data I think that suggests that our students are not being perceived as being stand-in prepared healthcare workers in any sense and that we need to make sure we're not putting them in situations where they are acting overly independent. With regard to after the fieldwork experience, 72% um, of preceptors received feedback from students and 71% engaged in debriefing. 48% uh, of partners wanted more students to come to their community, 52% said the current amount was fine, and 0% said they wanted less students. 0% said students come as ready practitioners, and 90% said they wish students would stay more in touch after their rotation. Only 0 to 25% of students ever return to those communities, which is also very important data. With regard to the qualitative data set, this is still being analyzed and coded, but some of the early quotes I wanted to point out include um, some of the biggest mistakes. So when, when partners were asked what are the biggest mistakes that students from the global north or other countries make, one of the quotes said, quote, they must abstain from over expectation and over criticism, must have a compassionate approach as the host and the team puts lots of effort in establishing the program. Quote, not respect of the environment and culture. They do not want to come out of their comfort zone, do not follow discipline and dress codes. However, this is not common to all. Quote, they tend to overexpect from the program sometimes as they want hands-on experience which cannot be provided very extensively, keeping local government administrative protocols in place. And quote, attempting to do too much and not be able to achieve goals. So additional qualitative data um, when asked what students should remember when they go home, partners remarked, quote, our culture and our dedication to make their time memorable, quote, the knowledge they gained here and the Indian hospitality during the program, some of them discover their potential, they should always believe in that potential, quote, to be a good doctor, you need to be a good listener, must listen to your patients very well, and quote, they can change the life of a person who is different if they are aware and respectful of that difference. So I'm going to turn the conversation over to Lori Dupree Brown, who's going to talk about actually implementation of the competencies. While competencies are a popular theoretical framework, as educators, we all know that the implementation piece is so critical and often very challenging. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. 
I'm going to speak a little bit about the experience of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Global Health Institute. We've been engaged in graduate programs for interprofessional and interdisciplinary global public health education since 2005 and undergraduate uh, programs since um, 2010. And so that um, that is, while it's wonderful to have all those years in the game, it's also humbling because we we feel that our best work is really just the most current prototype towards something better because this field just requires um, constant, constant reflection and, and improvement. And we were um, invited to share our experience really when, when CUGH was forming was the first time we presented our educational experience there. And that's when I met uh, Virginia Rothorn and was invited into that cross-learning conversation, um, that first conference that was led at the University of Maryland. And that was sort of the first window into how useful CUGH UGH could be as a as a force to accelerate and learn and improve more rapidly. So I've been really grateful for the, the CUGH community uh, in that regard. We've had approximately 1,500 students participate in our certificates, internships, field courses, clerkships, and rotations. And our student evaluations show that the vast majority of these students, over 80%, feel that their experiences were important or very important in shaping their view of health and well-being in the world. So in spite of the fact they have a primary activity or major, this um, complementary program is really, really important in that discernment space. Um, programs include as a formula at all levels, but at appropriate levels, some kind of place-based study in preparation, some kind of public health perspective. Um, a function, a reflection function that the field course leader does according to their own style where people think about culture and also themselves, you know, that change yourself kind of uh, aspect. And then also thinking about the connections between health, um, behavior, and environment, uh, health, and, and also the human-animal connection at the personal, local, and global level. So we very much are um, all about the local to global connection, partly because we are a state university with, a, with that local to global mission. We had a competency framework that we developed concurrently uh, with our programming in 2005. It was an interdisciplinary team. They were certainly functional. Uh, we included medicine, nursing, pharmacy, public health, and veterinary medicine in that conversation. But we realized we saw the need uh, to revise and improve these. And what our um, instructors heard from their field partners and from their students and from their own reflections was they wanted more of a focus on interprofessional teams. How can we work together in the field? And we wanted more of a uh, focus on topics such as justice, equity, ethics, and sociopolitical awareness. So Kevin Wynn, who is a physician's assistant and leads courses, um, leads our students in the field and interdisciplinary teams uh, annually or twice a year sometimes, is going to tell us about the process and, and working competencies that we have now. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I serve on a committee with Lori uh, that, adv that advises our Global Health Institute here at the University of Wisconsin. It is an interprofessional committee. Uh, it includes uh, representatives from medicine, nursing, pharmacy, physician assistant, vet med, and public health. Uh, we meet generally four times a year, and as Lori mentioned, uh, a recent task was to review and revise our 2005 competencies. Uh, so what we did in that process is formed a subcommittee. Uh, I kind of took the lead on that. We reviewed a number of articles uh, that had recently come out, including Dr. Eichbaum's as well as others on this, on this panel, uh, as well as existing CUGH resources, as well as kind of some of the existing global health competencies from our respective fields. A uh, smaller group kind of met separately and uh, drafted um, kind of a working draft of competencies, and we brought that recently back to our larger group, who was able to provide some feedback. Uh, the next slide does list our current uh, working 10 global health competencies. I want to emphasize that this is very much a work in progress. Uh, we have not yet implemented these on a large scale, but it's been a very useful process uh, to work through these in this uh, interprofessional group and um, to really draw and, I think, update them uh, for, our, for our current learners. I'm not going to read through these in detail, but I will highlight some uh, kind of key components that came through very strongly in the readings as well as kind of in reviewing the existing competencies. And that's first uh, is the importance of self-guided learning habits and recognizing that experiential learning opportunities exist in many forms and that students really need to be uh, proactive in terms of finding those learning opportunities that might be outside of what they expect, um, including in, in various disciplines, including the sciences, social sciences, and humanities. 
Um, as Laura mentioned, this, this information must be contextually grounded information, include details about a specific locations, health, history, politics, culture, et cetera. And as part of that, the students are expected to direct, uh, to practice directed self-assessment and reflection about their experiences, including about their own profession and kind of where they see their role uh, as a member of the healthcare team, how that relates to other health team members, and how that relates um, between, uh, you know, being members of high-income countries versus low-income countries. And you compare and contrast uh, those different settings. Um, it's very much a focus here at Wisconsin to draw connections between students' global health experiences and local needs. Many of the skill sets that they develop um, as part of their work abroad, uh, we really expect them to come back and identify those needs on a local level and apply those skills uh, here in Wisconsin and elsewhere where they work. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we are still, as I mentioned, very much a work in progress, uh, but we are definitely wanting to incorporate opportunities uh, for high and low middle income partners to learn from each other and to, creative, to creatively uh, evaluate our, our shared assets and addressing problems um, to the mutual benefits of learners and to the host community. So with that, um, we're uh, here to hear the, um, the, the next presentation and really, again, really grateful to be part of the um, CUGH community as we, as we build our program. Thank you, Lori and Kevin. So we have Quentin Eichbaum, who's really been in the forefront of thought leadership on controversies in competencies. Welcome, Quentin. Yeah, hi, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, <clears throat> I'm someone who grew up in a developing country in Africa and then came to the U.S., so the perspective of seeing this from two angles is something that has driven uh, the articles that I've written, and on the next slide, there are two of them. You can have the next slide. Uh, that, in which I delineate some of these arguments. Um, so, and I'm very glad that uh, the study that uh, Jessica has been leading and uh, participated in has started to actually look at the Global South and how they are viewing the question of competencies. So, the way I lay this out on the next slide is, um, problems I see with a lot of the debate, the way it's been proceeding until fairly recently, is that it's been insufficiently inclusive of input from low and middle income countries of the global south. Very often until you know, fairly recently, these competency lists, I think, were developed by committee consensus in high income countries and often, but not always, seem to serve the interests of the programs in high income countries. There have even been articles where uh, people have said that this list of competencies um, serves the values of our program, and I, I would have a problem that they should serve the interests of the of low and middle income countries as well. The second major controversy I would have is that they are they've taken insufficient uh, 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 view of the context of these countries in which uh, people are working in, and very often the lists have been drawn up to be transferable across contexts, and this will become clear as we proceed through this talk. That's often been a matter of convenience, that instead of being context-specific for the different areas in which uh, students and trainees are working, they have one list of competencies which can be used in any, any context, and I don't think that works very well. The third problem I see is what I would call the individualist-collectivist disjunction or divide, and that is um, uh, not sufficiently perceiving the differences in learning between in, uh, high and low income countries, which I will also go into. And the fourth controversy I would delineate is the methods of assessing competencies, I think, is, is, is deficient. So on the next slide, next slide, um, what I'm saying is that um, I'm speaking predominantly about a particular framework of uh, global health education in which we often send students from high-income countries to work in low-income countries, and I think there's certain learning dissonances that occur there. I'm aware that there are other models of global health, the local, long-term, bidirectional, and thirdly, I would say that some of the controversies I lay out don't only pertain to global health, but are also more generally applicable in, in the rest of global, rest of health professional education. So, um, the centrality of context was laid out very clearly in the seminal document in the Lancet in 2010, 
which stated that all aspects of, educa of the educational system are deeply affected by local and global contexts. Although many commonalities might be shared globally, there is local distinctiveness and richness. So on the next slide, I lay out what I'd call um, the argument <clears throat> as to whether context, uh, whether competencies are context-free or context-linked. And if you talk, and I'm, you get both, but a context-free uh, competency, you would call the competent practitioner is generally competence. The competencies can be taught and practiced independent to the particularities of a context. And competency in one context predicts competency in others. So if you can do something in the United States, you can do that. You're equally competent in a country in Africa with, that, with regard to that particular competency. On the other hand, I believe there is a set of competencies which have been under-recognized that are uh, very context-linked. And a practitioner there is competent with respect to that specific context. And the competency must be linked and taught with respect to the context. And being competent in one context does not predict being competent in another context. So we need then to bring in another set of terms that I alluded to earlier, and that is uh, the individualist approach to learning and a collectivist approach to learning. And this is very, very clearly and well laid out through the work of Hofstede. In the book you see a picture there, Cultures and Organizations, where they've brought out this, this uh, difference in, in learning uh, between individualist and collectivist countries. Also, people in academic medicine like Lorelei Lingard have uh, written quite eloquently about this. Anyway, individualist countries are predominantly high-income countries, as in the US, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. And they tend to understand themselves mostly through individual achievement. They're intrinsically competitive. And learning the way we understand it in individualist regions like the United States Learning is acquired and possessed by the individual, and learning is therefore transferable across contexts. Now, that isn't the way that collectivist cultures, which are often low- and middle-income countries, really understand learning. They understand themselves primarily with respect to the group they belong to, and they're intrinsically participatory, collaborative, and place the group's wishes over their own. In these settings, um, learning is situated or distributed, those are the words that are used, within the context, and they arise through participation from dynamic social interaction. And learning in these environments is context-dependent and not fully transferable across contexts. Now, for those of us who have grown up in individualist cultures, this is often a hard concept to understand, but from a point of view of a collectivist culture, it's equally hard to understand that someone would think that learning is something that the individual just acquires and um, is independent of, of, of uh, the cultural context they grow up in. So let's explore that a little bit further then on the next slide and see how these uh, views will actually affect how we think about um, uh, competencies in different cultures and particularly how we assess them because I think we are trying to assess our students and evaluate programs in particular settings but it doesn't always work. The one reason for this is that low resource settings you have an inadequate direct observation of students and uh, trainees in terms of the competency they're trying to achieve. And this has been written about a lot in academic medicine by Eric Holmby, that even in our high-income individualist cultures where we are looking for to assess competency in trainees, particularly in medicine, they're inadequately observed to see if they really attained that competency. But in a low-resource setting, the lack of faculty in overcrowded hospitals and clinics means that we're sending students into these environments where there's just not the... Uh, resources to really be able to see if that student has attained the particular competency that we want them to attain. Secondly, there's a lack of frame of reference to assess high-income country trainees. They are trained in high-income settings and then sent into low-income settings where the faculty and assessors are not quite sure what they are expected to know, how they should compare alongside local trainees, 
and how to assess the high income country trainees alongside their local trainees. Now I've experienced that in many of the settings I've worked in in Africa where the students are, there's this disjunction, students train in one setting and faculty expected to assess them and see where they are supposed to be at in the local context. On the next slide, next slide, next slide, um, the thing that's been written about quite a lot is the inadequacy of the checkbox format and I think many of us know that that's inadequate but it's still often done. We put boxes alongside the uh, competencies we want people to attain and we check them off and have seen that done that kind of way and I think that this can easily lead to overconfidence in, in our trainees thinking they've attained something when they may sort of have attained it in one context but not in all contexts. The fourth shortcoming I lay out there is the intrinsic competence of the low income setting may not be quite where we expect it to be. This has been written about by Karachi and Englander where they talk about the uh, clinical microsystems in which one trains being very important in terms of how competency is transferred and assessed in another setting. Similarly, David Ash has done a well-known study showing that competence of specific training environments is affected by where you were actually trained. So I actually don't think that many of the settings in low-income countries are sufficiently uh, apprised of the whole notion of competency to really know how to uh, fully assess whether a particular trainee from a high-income country has attained it. The fifth uh, shortcoming in assessment is that we have a lack of continuing education to maintain these competencies. And CME is a big concept, at least in medicine and clinical training, where we constantly want to know if someone has attained and maintained a particular competency because we know very well that competency wanes over time. And so we don't really have adequate models for assessing whether someone is still competent. In particular, low and middle income countries, the settings can change quite quickly with regard to epidemiology and socio-political environments. And so one might think one's competent and years later uh, not have maintained that particular competency and that may lead to overconfidence. On the next slide, um, the two concepts that I think are very pertinent here and have also been discussed by other leaders in the field are the notions of an acquired competency and a participatory competency and I've discussed those further in the second article that came out recently in academic medicine and the notion of an acquired competency that fits in very well with our approach to knowledge in high income countries is generally a knowledge and skills kind of approach to, not, to competency just as an example, I took one there from ophthalmology, medical knowledge competency, which by the ACGME states that this, the trainee must demonstrate competencies in their knowledge of cataract surgery, contact lenses, corneal and external disease, eye abnormalities and glaucoma. Well, that's the kind of knowledge you can study and keep in your mind and that generally pertains across contexts in high and middle income countries. So that's a kind of an acquired competency which you can learn and you can acquire and you can possess and can be transferred across different contexts. However, there are a group of competencies I'd call participatory competencies and those entail things like communication and collaboration. And in ophthalmology they would lay this out as one of them is interpersonal communication skills where this particular one would state that the trainee must communicate effectively with patients, families, and the public as appropriate across a broad range of socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. Well, that's not something you can just study from a book and acquire because that is very much dependent on participation in that particular context and culture. So on the next slide uh, is another example with regard to a, a, a very tangible case that we experienced at the MEPI meeting of PEPFAR in Mozambique in 2014 where I started to develop these ideas where there were check boxes. One of them said uh, can interpret viral loads and CD4 counts in patients with HIV AIDS. Well that you can learn and that's an acquired competence and that pertains across different contexts. On the other hand close by that competency was one stated counsel a dying patient. I don't think that is something that is transferable across cultures. 
counseling a dying patient in a hospice in North America is very different to doing that in a particular setting in rural Africa. So the second one would be an example of a participatory competency that is very dependent on the context and participation. And the first one is an acquired competency that can be learned and transferred across cultures. So on the next slide, um, I looked at these in four competency domains of major global health organizations. And you would notice there that at least with regard to the core domains, many of them are participatory competencies. And I think we've made a mistake in that regard to think that you can just check them off and learn them in a high income setting in North America and just transfer them across to a low income country and, and think that they pertain there equally well. So on the next slide, what I've laid out is that we need a different method of assessing participatory competencies. The standard method of assessing an acquired competency is through observation. You look at a student, can they do it, and then you can assess them as being competent, or psychometric methods. That's what we standardly use in, in our North American uh, settings. Um, but what we need for a participatory competency is a multidimensional approach that involves input from other co-assessing healthcare teams, individuals, and includes also the trainee. This is where we begin to talk about self-directed learning. So instead of just having one preceptor or evaluator determining whether someone has acquired this competency, it's a more of a, a group approach. And there are different qualitative and mixed methods for doing this from the social sciences that include self-directed learning, narrative, ethnographic approaches, realist inquiry, and others. But on the next slide, as I lay out in the articles, I uh, think that the one that is developed or expounded upon by Eva and Rija at, uh, in Vancouver is self-directed assessment seeking. And in that kind of way of assessment, the trainee proactively seeks feedback and assessment from a range of relevant sources and is empowered to do so by the system and by faculty, and then translates this feedback into improving performance. So instead of just having a top-down assessment of the competency, the, the trainee is very intimately involved in getting feedback and involving a lot of different people in a participatory approach towards assessment. So it's not just individualistic, it involves peers, teachers, and other sources of information. And that has been shown, actually, to be a much more reliable form of assessment by uh, authors like Mon and Van Loon and at Maastricht. Um, it also fits with the notion from the Lancet document of 2010 of transprofessionalism to try as much as we can to include ancillary health workers in low resource settings in our healthcare system endeavors. On the following slide, um, the other, this approach of self-directed assessment seeking, as I said, fits in with transprofessionalism of the Lancet document, interprofessional collaboration, and transformative learning. I have developed the term of resourceful learning, which um, is a notion of putting someone in a low resource setting where they have to uh, draw on all their all the resources of that environment to promote their own learning. Coriat developed the term in 2004 and earlier of desirable difficulties where people learn very well when they put in a low resource and difficult setting. And then we've developed, uh, myself and Holmby have developed the models of sharing where we need to move towards much more of a, a sharing kind of notion of, of learning. So on the next slide, um, I just want to touch briefly on the notion of cultural competence. I'm definitely not not against it, but I just think that we've been doing this in a, a somewhat uh, simplistic manner because I think cultural competencies are loaded with assumptions and perceptions and often you know, complex intersections with identity and life experience, and we need it all cost to try and avoid blurring the boundaries with gl global movements and leading into a certain stereotyping of cultures. So we, the problem I have with the way we are doing cultural competency is it's often taught as something we can acquire and possess as a form of knowledge rather than something more participatory and situated in a particular context. And I think this is very well summarized by Anna Kumagai's statement, the culture is not an abdominal exam. 
And I think that's the way we may be teaching it. You can, like an abdominal exam on a patient, you can learn cultural competence. So I do think we need to reassess the way we think about cultural competence and even humility. I think different cultures understand humility in different kinds of ways. So I'm all in favor of humility and awareness. I just think we need to also be cognizant of the particular context in which we are talking about humility. So on the following slide, I just would like to conclude um, that my controversial components of this are that we need to keep in mind that com competencies may either be context-free, definitely a lot of them are context-free, particularly those that are related to knowledge and skills, but there are also some, and those are the participatory competencies that are very context-linked. So that's what I say in point number two, that competencies can be individually acquired as knowledge and skills and transferred across context, but others are situated in dynamic social settings linked to context and need to be learned through participation. And so these acquired and participatory competencies require different methods of assessment. And we need a lot more work on how we assess competencies, in particular, how we assess participatory competencies. And then lastly, and uh, finally, I think we need, and we are getting there with the study that will be coming out, um, a more inclusive process in which we look at the Global South and try and reach a more nuanced uh, classification of and participatory approach towards competencies. So anyway, that, that's all I have to say, and thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Hand it back to Jess. Thank you so much, Quentin. That was really illustrious and appreciate it. We're going to launch into our discussion and question and answer session. Again, just to remind you, you can ask questions using the question box um, in your right side control panel. Um, the first question, Quentin, I think might be best handled by you. Catherine Hartzell asks, isn't self-directed assessment seeking related to humility? Would you comment on that, Quentin? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, that's an interesting point. Um, I think there's a controversy in this notion of self, self-assessment and self-directed assessment. Some people have argued that, um, self-assessment can get misdirected quite quickly and, and lead to overconfidence. And that's why it absolutely has to be tempered by bringing in other people in, in, in the, setting you're working in. And so self-directed assessment seeking, on the one hand, empowers the individual, but also makes them, as you point out, brings in an element of humility that it's not just about you and your assessment, but that you have to bring in other people to be giving you feedback all the time. So absolutely, I think there, there can be an element of overconfidence, but you're right, it does involve humility. And I don't want you to misunderstand, I'm not against humility at all. I think it's a, an absolute requirement, very necessary. All I was saying is that humility, we need to look at it, uh, how it's understood in different cultures. And because I, I think that that's, um, we may come in with one particular way of what humility is, and some cultures understand it a little differently. But I do agree, um, self-directed assessment seeking is gives other people the opportunity to provide feedback about one's, uh, one's capacity and capability and competency. So in that sense, it is, uh, does have humility in it. Thank you. Quentin, Nyla for Hassan Daze asks, um, do we ever run the risk of overgeneralizing cultural norms when interacting with patients? Do we ever run the risk of overgeneralizing cultural norms? Yeah. When interacting with patients? Yeah. Well, that, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I would say uh, yes, um, because that's part of what I'm saying. We need to be very careful of, of the setting and context and culture we are dealing with. And that's why even within one particular culture, as we may view it, I think we may have many more nuances within that culture than we are aware of. I, I, I do believe there are cultures, absolutely. And I like a recent book called The Culture Map um, by Aaron Meyer, which is quite good in that sense. But I think that we do stand the risk of overgeneralizing cultural norms because I think cultures are not static. They, they change 
even though there are generalities about it, I think one should be very attuned to uh, what a particular culture or microculture is. And I'm not an anthropologist, so anyone who is might want to chime in there, but that's just the feeling that I have about uh, cultural norms. Mm -hmm. And Trisha Todd from the University of Minnesota asks, how does one elicit, quote, feedback when you might be in a cultural context that does not tend to give negative feedback? So many cultures, you know, value hospitality and agreeability. So, Quentin, how do you suggest people get feedback uh, when you're in cultures where negativity is not usually put forth, particularly to visitors? That, that, that's an excellent question, and I think that's that's really very, very true about, you know, Many cultures don't like like doing that. Um, um, I don't have a ready baked answer, but one one solution to that is that uh, this is why getting feedback from different sources and being a, we need to develop methods of actually gaining that feedback because I think to some extent that depends on how you request the feedback. Um, uh, you know, if you go in and uh, sort of whatever demanding kind of manner you may not get it, but there are ways in which you may pose the question or uh, interact with the person and with a variety of people that may provide one with more feedback. But I fully agree that there are you know settings where people do not provide readily the feedback may, one may want, particularly if they don't uh, know you sufficiently well enough. In many cases it takes time for them to understand you a little bit better. So. I think um, it, it's probably something we need to look at more carefully and one way may also be, I don't think it always has to be verbal, but it can also be, you know, a, a mix of verbal and, uh, uh, you know, instruments and ways people can write it or verbalize it or different ways of getting feedback should also be explored. But I think that, that's a very pertinent point, definitely worth further research. Great. And um, a question for Lori. So, Lori, you have been successful at spearheading interprofessional education and competency-based education. Um, how have you found success in getting credit offered for interprofessional skills building and um, fitting that into different degrees, paradigms for credit and, and grading, et cetera? Well, um, in general, what we've uh, done is we've offered complementary credit-bearing experiences and designed them from the beginning so that they fit into a lot of different programs. So in terms of the classroom work, there are classes, um, usually there's a core, both at our undergraduate and graduate level, and residents can also take this as well as in-service providers. So they're all together, you know, in, in the same room or online. And so those complementary programs are credit bearing and they're designed together and then we try to really encourage uh, interprofessional or interdisciplinary uh, and including people that don't necessarily come classify as professional although I think that's a, a weird divide but we have all kinds of allied healthcare providers if you will involved in the field work so students will be um, getting credit and they'll be getting credit, they might be all registered for something differently and they're having the experience together, but by working together in team teaching and different pairings over time and by having some online resources that they can also use, um, we can do it. The main challenge is very mundane, it's, it's scheduling, you know, semesters start and end at different times and some people have more class hours and the way lab work works, so if you build relationships among the faculty members and then also offer flexible modules online, which we do have uh, a, a set of those that faculty can use however they want, that helps a great deal. Great, and I'm going to open this up to all the panelists. Julie Rosenberg comments, there are limits to how much participatory learning we can offer students in a university setting. How well do you think the case teaching method can support experiential learning, and should that become a new standard for teaching global health? So who wants to comment on the case teaching method and, and the limits of the university to provide experiential learning? Uh, Jess, this is Linda Wilson. I'd just like to make one comment on that. I think case studies can be excellent, and in our toolkit we will have many case study resources. But I also want to encourage all of us to look in our own backyards for experiential learning opportunities that are equally valuable, whether it's uh, 
working with um, recent immigrant communities or migrant communities or other uh, disadvantaged communities in our own backyards, I think these same competencies would apply. Thanks. Excellent. Um, another question from Nyla for Hassan Zaza, and I know Nyla for she's a student um, and a leader within AMSA. Uh, I think this question is really important, and anyone who wants to take it uh, should go ahead. But the question is, as we look upon cross-cultural competency and ethical reasoning, the aspect of patient welfare and patient autonomy is central to our work. What I have not seen addressed is how the patient can acquire knowledge of the quality of care they are receiving. How are they supposed to know if the quality of care they are receiving is not standard? Are, are there ways I can strengthen patient education in a respectful and culturally sensitive manner? I would, I, this is Lori and other, others may, I'm sure you'll get more than one comment, but I would say that in general, I'm suspicious of an arrangement where um, the relationship is directly um, organizing something where you're the direct care providers and you're not working through um, local care providers. So then I think fostering a conversation um, with yourself and your local partners and their patients is, is um, can help with that because you are gonna you're not you're not gonna try to get them to do things exactly the way you do, but finding finding a space that makes sense. But if you're directly um, I would question why you'd be directly working without that intermediary local partner because then that whole capacity building basic principle that Virginia mentioned would be lost. You'd just be, you know, invisible to any kind of systemic change. Mm -hmm. And I'll just point out Trisha Todd's um, Global Ambassadors for Patient Safety Modules are open source from University of Minnesota. Really great resource for those of you that are struggling with this and, and the tendency for organizations to place students beyond their level of competency um, and providing differential standards of care or not clear uh, with patients as to who the care providers are. Um, Quentin, a question. What frameworks are being tested for assessment of participatory competencies that you're aware of or that anyone else on the panel is aware of? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of anyone being actively tested right now. Um, I think it's um, in global health, at least. Um, the self-directed assessment seeking and the ethnographic methods and realist methods are certainly part and parcel of education research. And part of what I think we need a bit of catch up from in global health is the uh, work that's going on in medical education and health professional education, some of the research methodologies there which are have been incredibly improved over the last few years and some really outstanding programs. We haven't fully translated or looked at those sufficiently and translated them into global health. So what I would say is I'm not aware of this having been properly done and I probably want to write about this in, in global health, but it's certainly those kinds of methods have been used in other medical education settings. Great. And yes. Solyndra, oh sorry, go ahead. Hi, this is Linda Wilson. I just wanted to mention one other thing. It's not specifically testing competencies, but I wanted folks to be aware that there is a World Federation of Academic Institutions for Global Health. It's a consortium that includes CUGH as well as regional groups in Africa and Asia and Latin America, Europe, and they ha had a meeting last April in Geneva, in the Geneva Health Forum, to try to discuss the global perspective on competencies and are going to now try to work to develop an online open access module. And the focus will be planetary health, which I think is a, a term we need to start incorporating in our thinking a little bit more. Uh, hopefully this will be available on the website of the United Nations University in Kuala Lumpur. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. Um, last question, Shalinda, uh, Shalinda Saleshi um, asks, again, how does this work for students in the Global South and their need to understand the culture of the Global North? Isn't that as important? So maybe someone can comment on um, generally the competencies and whether learning from the Global South perspective about the Global North is equally represented or not, or where we can go to further build that. 
Um, this is Linda one last time. I, uh, the work that we've been doing in nursing from the beginning has, in, has involved a collaborative effort between nursing faculties in the WHO collaborating centers in Brazil and Mexico, and uh, we've, we've surveyed uh, nursing faculty in Latin America and also Africa. We, we want to continue to reach out to other parts of the world. This work has been replicated in Asia, in Vietnam, and in Korea. But I think, I think uh, all of us who are recognizing the need for a much more comprehensive approach and that the uh, people all over the world need to learn about one another and learn to uh, understand and live together better, I would say. If I can just add one, I think we're running out of time, but I can make a quick com comment. It's Quentin. Um, I, I think one shouldn't underestimate that uh, students and trainees and faculty in other parts of the world are much more apprised of what is going on in high income countries than the other way around. And to me, this is part of the colonialist legacy that um, I think people understand that much better than we do. So I don't think that is the most, the major part of the problem. It's the other way around. And, and this is more. Okay. I, I guess I would add too that um, in addition to these programs that are mainly for students, other kinds of models that can be at your institution that can cross fertilize here are these twinning models where you know we're intentionally doing comparative systems learning to um, create change and learn from each other on both sides. And so when that kind of thing is happening, like we have a, a we've had a twinning program with Ethiopia, and so when that's happening alongside of um, these other kinds of programs, then people do get to um, come here and do kind of a different kind of exchange. They're teaching our students, they're learning, and really shaking it up so everyone can see the benefits for both sides. And it really does does get away from the mindset that this would be one-way learning. So I do think the two-way learning um, starts to change the paradigm there. And really, everybody is going from personal to local to global, wherever their personal is based. You can imagine all these lights going off and and you know, growing larger um, in all these spaces, rather than becoming global, being something that students from the economic, um, e economically privileged countries do. So um, that's you know, that's more of a dream. But we've had a good experience so far with our Ethiopia twinning program. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to recognize the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Again, if you're not a member, you can join both as an institution or as an individual. Please visit www.cugh.org. Check them out on Twitter. There's an email address on your screen, info at cugh.org, if you want to learn more. And um, from all of us to all of you, thank you for joining us and for being a part of this solidarity to improve and expand global health education. Take good care. Goodbye. Yeah,